Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going into Unit 2, Topic 4 of AP Psychology, Neural Firing. Now if you haven't watched my last two videos, pause this video and go check out my video on the endocrine system and also the nervous system. Those videos will be important for you to understand everything that's going to be in this video. Alright, so by now you know that the nervous system is pretty complex and it's made up of a bunch of different parts. Each part has its own specific function that allow us to be us. Remember, our nervous system is made up of different neurons. We have sensory neurons. Also also known as afferent neurons. These neurons receive information and signals from our sensory receptors and they send that information up to our brain and spinal cord. Make sure you remember these neurons send information to the brain and spinal cord. The two is important there. Once the brain gets that information, it processes that information and then it sends the information back to the body through the motor neurons, also known as the efferent neurons. These allow information to travel from our brain to the rest of the body. One way you can remember this is afferent approaches the brain and efferent exits the brain. A for approach and E for exit. We also have mirror neurons. These neurons are why when someone yawns, you might start to yawn. These neurons mimic, they react to the actions of another or ourselves. Now, in order for neurons to send a message, they need to receive enough stimulation to cause an action potential. Neurons can only send one signal at a time and can only be sent at a set speed and strength. Now, you might be asking, well, how can the signals then be distinguished? Well, it's all about the frequency. Neurons can change the number of signals depending on the rate in which they're being sent. Your brain is able to understand the differences in the frequency and process the signals sent by the neuron. When a neuron sends a message, the physiological process is known as an action potential. This is when a neuron fires an impulse down the axon. Now, I can already hear some of you asking, how does all this happen? What can cause neurons to fire these electrical impulses? Well, think about your neuron like a battery. For example, this battery right here that I'm holding has both a positive end and a negative end. Right now, this battery has the potential to release energy. But it can't do that unless there's a connection made between the two ends. A neuron is similar. You have in your body positively charged and negatively charged ions. Your cell membranes separate the ions and creates an environment on either side of the barrier that is overall positive or overall negative. This gives your neurons potential. Some ions are able to cross the membrane more easily than others, which is known as permeability. Think about it like having a ticket to a concert. If you don't have a ticket, you can't get into the venue. Certain ions have characteristics that'll allow them to pass more easily easily through the neuron's membrane. When a neuron is not sending a signal, it has more negative ions in the inside than on the outside, and that's called a resting potential. When a neuron is resting, there are a lot of positive ions outside the membrane waiting to enter. Neurons in a state of rest are polarized, and in order for them to send a signal, an action potential, the process of depolarization must occur. For a neuron to depolarize, there has to be an outside stimulus. Let's say all of a sudden a plate falls on your foot. This would stimulate sensory afferent neurons. This would cause ion channels along the cell membrane membrane of the neuron to open, letting more positive ions inside. This increases the positive charge inside the membrane, which triggers the action potential. Now, not all stimuli to a neuron causes an action potential. There has to be enough positive ions let in. If there are enough where the resulting change is strong enough to meet the threshold, the depolarization occurs and the neuron fires an action potential. If it does not meet the threshold, there is no firing and there will be no action potential, and the neuron will return to a resting state. This is important to remember that neurons act in kind of an all or nothing gain. When an action potential occurs, it sends a signal down the axon to the other neurons in the nervous system. After one neuron goes through an action potential and goes through the process of depolarization, the process of repolarization occurs in order to bring the neuron back to resting potential. During this repolarization process, different ion channels open back up to try and rebalance the charges by letting more positive ions outside of the cell membrane. When all of this is happening and the signal is moving down the axon, the neuron cannot respond to any other stimulus. This is known as the refractory period. When this happens, the neuron needs another stimulus in order to meet the threshold or intensity level to be able to fire again. Now, all right, so all this is great and all, but I can already hear some of you asking, well, what happens after a signal is shot down the axon? How does the signal or action potential connect from one neuron to another neuron? And to answer that, we need to look at the synapse, which is composed of parts of two different neurons. Remember, the neuron is made up of dendrites, the cell body, the axon, the axon terminal. Once the action potential has occurred, the message message has been sent through the axon until it reaches the end of the neuron called the axon terminal. In the last video, we talked about the process of an action potential reaching the axon terminal and that neurotransmitters were released into the space between the two neurons to further send the information. This space is where the signal is converted and sent to another neuron. Now, there are electrical synapses and chemical synapses. Electrical synapses are for messages that need to be sent quickly and immediately. They are connected and have no space between neurons. Chemical synapses, on the other hand, take 
take longer to process. Most of the interactions we're talking about are going to be chemical synapses. Chemical synapses use neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers that are diffused across a synaptic gap to deliver their messages. The synaptic gap is also known as the synaptic cleft. It's a narrow space between the neurons, specifically the presynaptic terminal of one neuron and the postsynaptic terminal of the next neuron. It's easy to remember if you break down the word pre before the synapse and post after the synapse. The presynaptic terminal is the axon terminal of the neuron, which converts the electrical signal to a chemical one and sends the neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap. The postsynaptic terminal is where the neurotransmitters are accepted in the dendrites, the receptor region of the receiving neuron. Remember from our last video, the dendrites extend outward from the soma and have receptors at the end of them. This allows them to be able to receive messages from previous neurons. Now, since I mentioned neurotransmitters, there are lots of different types that do different things. I want to highlight the different types of neurotransmitters our bodies use before continuing with how neurons send signals and messages. Up first, we have acetylcholine, which enables muscle action, learning, and memory. When you are moving around, your body is firing off acetylcholine. If your body is not making enough acetylcholine, you become at risk for diseases such as Alzheimer's. Next is dopamine. It helps with our movement, learning, attention, and emotion. It's often referenced as a natural drug because of how it impacts your feelings and emotions. If your body has too much dopamine, you are at risk for schizophrenia, and an undersupply could lead you to develop a decrease in your mobility and possibly Parkinson's disease. Serotonin impacts your hunger, sleep, arousal, and mood. If your body does not produce enough serotonin, you are at risk for depression. If you have too much serotonin, you might experience obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, or headaches. This is often known as the feel-good chemical. Up next is endorphins, which help with pain control. This is like your body is producing its own morphine. If you're lacking endorphins, you'll have a lower pain threshold. If you have an excess, you will have a higher pain threshold. Also, if you remember from the 2.2 topic review video, epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine are also significant hormones and neurotransmitters in the body. They both work together on the body's fight or flight response that will increase your heart rate, expand the air passages of the lungs, and redistributes blood to muscles. You could say that they help with your alertness and arousal. The last two types of neurotransmitters we're going to be talking about is glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is involved with excitatory messages. It helps us with long-term memory and learning. It is used more by neurons than any other neurotransmitter. If you have an excess amount, it might overstimulate the brain, which could create seizures, insomnia, or give you a migraine. GABA helps us with sleep and movement. It slows down your nervous system. If you do not have enough GABA, this might lead to seizures, tremors, or insomnia. So you can see that each neurotransmitter helps communicate different messages and has different impacts on our body. Remember, the nervous system sends a chemical signal through neurotransmitters. The neuron sends these neurotransmitters across the synaptic gap, also known as the synaptic cleft. And again, this is the narrow space between the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic terminal. Now, depending on which neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, we might see the neuron get excited or inhibited. Excitatory neurotransmitters will increase the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential through the depolarization process in the postsynaptic neuron. This is because the inside of the neuron will become more positive and will push the neuron towards the intensity or threshold needed for it to have an action potential. On the other hand, an inhibitory neurotransmitter will decrease the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential. This leads to hyperpolarization to occur, which is when the inside of the neuron becomes more negative, which moves farther away from its threshold or intensity needed for an action potential. Each part of a neuron could have hundreds of synapses, and each of those synapses has different inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters. So the odds of a postsynaptic neuron experiencing an action potential depend on the sum of all excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters in the area. Once the neurotransmitters have passed their messages onto the postsynaptic neuron, they unbind with the receptor. Some of the neurotransmitters are destroyed and others get reabsorbed. This process of taking excess neurotransmitters left in the synaptic gap is known as reuptake. This is when the sending neuron at the presynaptic terminal reabsorbs the extra neurotransmitters. In our next video, we'll be talking more about the release and reabsorption of neurotransmitters, as this is where many legal and also illegal drugs exploit. When exciting the production, release, and reuptake of neurotransmitters or inhibiting it, drugs can elicit different effects on our body. But all of that is for the next video. Don't forget now to answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comments section below. Also, if you need more help with AP Psychology, make sure to check out my Ultimate Review Packet. It has summary videos for all of the different topics in AP Psychology. It also has study guides, answer keys, practice quizzes, and more. I've included different documents to help you with Unit 2 as well that look at the neuron, the nervous system, and also the brain. Hopefully this will help you get an A in your class and also a 5 on the national exam. All right, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching today. And as always, I'll see you next time online.